right. Um, well, welcome everybody online and in person. I know more people are joining, at least that's my my assumption. Sonia has a question about the RPA class I did yesterday. Send me an email and I'll share it with you. I'm not really in a position to do that at this moment, not in my normal office location. So why don't we go ahead and get started, you know? Why not? Um, why not? I assume everybody can hear me that's online and raise your hand, somebody. I see Saul's here twice. Maybe nobody can hear me. Let me make sure audio is. Oh, okay. Jane can hear, Monica can hear. That's all I need to go. All right, we're talking today about planning, right? Everybody's favorite subject, maybe. And the, those of you that are online, there are some handouts. Those of you that came in person, I printed some of them out. I have to admit I'm out of practice printing out handouts and showing up at locations. You know, I brought most of my equipment, but not all of it. Um, hopefully we'll get back used to that, right? Because the nice thing, what is the best thing about the in-person meetings? This is a, an audience participation part. If you guys are real estate agents, you should know the answer to this. The best part of the in-person training sessions. What is it? Lunch. Lunch. Very good. I knew. I knew Khalid would, would get that one right away. It's a free lunch. Yeah. yeah that's, a, that's, that's generally it. It's not. Um, yeah, Monica got that online. Yeah. Anyhow, so, um, and that'll be coming, right? Our, our sponsor will is bringing... Um, you know, filet mignon and lobster and all of the stuff that you normally get from Togo's. Um, today, we're gonna to talk about planning, right? business planning. And there's copies of the handouts that are online. I'm gonna jump around. Um, for those of you that are here, there's a handout over at the door when you came in, most of you got it. If you want to connect to the Wi-Fi, the code is there for those of you that want to do that. And one of the things that makes business planning something of a challenge is that it works differently for people that are at different levels. So what are the different levels of being in real estate? The first level is, as the little pyramid you know, shows, is a foundation level. And when people are new, uh, you know, you need to learn how to use the multiple listing service. You know, you need to learn how to use RPR. You need to learn how to use zip forms. You need to learn how to do a CMA. You need to learn how to uh, search for properties and analyze properties. And there's a whole bunch of technical stuff that you need to do. You may need to learn the software that your broker has given you um, and on and on and on and on, right? Some of you that have been coming to my training sessions uh, every week or have looked at my YouTube channel, right? My YouTube channel, I think, has got close to 500 videos right? Something like that. And all my videos aren't there, but there's lots of different subjects that you need to learn. And by the way, this is one of the reasons that most, I'm going to say it, most people that start out in real estate don't make it. I don't know if you've ever heard that, right? You know, it's a sad, it's a sad thought. But um, most of the people that begin a real estate career do not succeed in real estate. The percentages are debatable. You hear trainers online saying that 90% drop out. According to the California Association of Realtors, more than 30 to 40% of the people who get a real estate license do not renew it at the end of their first four years. Um, uh, there are some areas where the Board of Realtors has reported that almost half of the people that join the Board of Realtors drop out of the Board of Realtors within 18 months. Why do they do that? Early retirement, right? They made so much money that they didn't have to keep working anymore. Um, or maybe they're not making enough money to justify to themselves or to a spouse why they're paying the dues to stay in real estate. 
And why do people not make it, but some do, right? I actually have a class, which I haven't done in a while, called Why People Fail in Real Estate, right? Um, there are a lot of reasons, but one of, the, one of the driving reasons, I think, is that real estate compared to most professions is too easy to get into. And those of you that have taken the real estate exam recently might want to argue and say, oh no, that was tough, that was hard. You know, I had to study, you know, I had to take open book final exams, you know, and cheat my way through them, you know, it was awful. But if you think about what a doctor would go through, what a lawyer would go through, what an engineer would go through in order to be in their profession, it doesn't, this isn't much. Right. My father was an orthopedic surgeon, and one year he was both um, proud of me and unhappy because I made more money than he did, which he didn't understand the logic of that. Right. Because, you know, he was a doctor. Um, but real estate is relatively easy to get into. And because it's easy to get into, it's easy to get out of. There's no shame really in being a failed real estate agent. Right. There's lots of them. Right. How many of you know people that have started a real estate career and dropped out? Right. Most people raise their hands when I ask that question. They don't make you walk around with a scarlet letter that says failed, you know, name of failed real estate agent. So it's easy to get into. It's easy to, to get out of. And it's optional while you're in it. Right. It's optional. I, nobody usually is looking over your shoulder and telling you what to do. They're not threatening to fire you, right? If you sleep till noon, right? No one is calling you at 10 o'clock saying, where are you? Why aren't you working, right? And when you put those things together, um, when you put those things together, a lot of people just don't make it. And part of the problem is the foundation, right? And my my metaphor for the foundation part is if you have if you think of the real estate business or getting your career going like having a um a train car right not the train you know but just the car and the idea is we're trying to get the train car to move and we're going to get it to move by pushing it well if the train car is at rest right now it takes a lot of push to get it to move the ratio of push to movement is very, very high, right? Inertia is a very powerful force. But once it starts to move, right? Once it starts to roll, the ratio of push to movement drops dramatically. And the faster it goes, the less push is needed to keep it going. And at a certain part, you have momentum where you can sit on the railroad car and ride it for a while. And when we look at how real estate agents get their business, you'll see what I mean. A significant percentage of the real estate business comes from sphere of influence and repeat and referral clients, a significant percentage. And so many people who get into real estate don't get through that first stage, right? So they don't put in the effort. They may not have the time. It's too hard. They give up and never reach the stage where they get momentum. Pipeline is something that I'm going to talk about where a pipeline, I knew an agent, he was, this was back in my Century 21 days, who was the number one Century 21 agent in the United States 10 times. And back then prices weren't nearly as high, but he was grossing over a million dollars a year with a 250 to $300,000 price range. He did not have a big team. Right. He, his name was Jim Drews, D-R-O-Z. He was the top agent. And after 10 years, he retired and he sold his real estate practice to another agent for a six figure initial payout plus a percentage over the next few years. So the question is, what did he sell them? Right. His name badges, his unused business cards his open house signs, what actually did he sell them? And the answer is he sold them his database. How many of you have ever had the experience where you're going to a dentist, right? And you show up and your dentist is not there, right? There's a new dentist there. And that dentist is saying, I've taken over Dr. So-and-so's practice. What did the doctor sell to the new dentist? And the answer is they sold us, 
right? They sold you, right? So that's what they sold. So one of the questions I have for agents is, how valuable is your database, right? If you're going to retire and you were going to sell it to somebody else, how much money would they pay you to have your pipeline or your database? And some people are probably thinking, I don't know what a database is. Um, let's see, we have a question. Will you be recording this webinar? I record everything. So I do that, by the way, because I make a lot of extra money from recording my, my, my classes. I sell them to insomniacs on um online and then well anyhow yeah, there's a joke there someplace but some of you slept through it all right so what what a pipeline means and i'm not doing the sales funnel right which you guys have probably seen before but what a pipeline means do you know how many people that are first of all do you have a database we're going to talk about that do you know who's in it and how many of the people that are in your database are likely to do something buy sell or invest in real estate next month the month after, the month after, next year, right? And now if, you're, if you know that, you can start to predict what your business is going to be like. One of the, the challenges for people that want to transition out of a full-time job, um, out of a full-time job and to, um, uh, is you wanna make sure you're gonna make enough money from real estate I'll close that. I'll answer, answer Pooja's question in a minute. Um, you're going to make a certain amount of enough money from real estate to supplement or to replace your, your existing income. And that usually doesn't mean you're going to quit your job if you have one month where you make more money than you do from your current job. But two months, you're getting a little warmer. Three months, four months. And when you can see people that are going to buy, sell, or invest next month and the month after and the month after. So what happens after the foundation is that people develop a pipeline. Now, one of the questions I was just asked is, doesn't that belong to your broker, your database? And the answer is, if you work for Compass, Keller Williams, Coldwell Banker, Century 21, and you use their software, they've got your database. They have your database. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons if you're at Keller Williams and Compass and Coldwell Banker and you look at the top agents in your office and you look at how many of them are using the company's website and the company's CRM, Customer Relationship Management System, and the answer is virtually none of them do that. And the reason they don't do that is because they know if they leave, I mean, Gary Keller might be reading your emails at night. Right. I mean, I don't think he's that bored, but you get the idea. If you leave, they'll turn over your database to another agent. And some agents that are naive tell me, no, 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 I'll delete everybody before I go. Right. You know, oh, yeah, that's going to work. Right. There's no way they can restore it. And by the way, one of the things I like about EXP, and I'm not going to make this about EXP, is, is that EXP does not own the database. We use a system called KV Core, which all of you could sign up for right now if you took out your credit card and went to their website. It might cost $300 a month, but anybody could sign up. So by having a firewall between the company and the website and the CRM, right? agents know that if they put people in that CRM and they choose to leave, number one, they could delete everybody because exp can't peek under your hood right doesn't have any idea what you've got in your database or number two you could go into kv core and say hey i've changed offices and upload a new logo and change the address and take over the payments and they'll be fine with that right but you see that's one of the reasons that that's one of, real estate agents are sometimes migratory creatures Right, you know, sometimes they go from one office to another office to another office. And one of my suggestions, this isn't necessarily about business planning, is use your own email system. When I left Keller Williams, the first thing they did was cut off access to email, even though I had transactions going. I don't use company email systems anymore, right? Nice guys. And have your, your, own, um, your own domain, and have your own CRM, right? So that you have control over it. But when the next step from understanding the foundation parts of being in real estate to doing a lot of business is developing a pipeline. 
and we're going to talk a little bit about it. The top agents have a pipeline. I used to be a productivity coach for Keller Williams, and I was the director of training for Century 21 at one time, um, a lot of stuff like that. And what where I'm going with that is that, um, where am I going with that? The agents would come to me when I was a productivity coach, and they would say, these were experienced agents, I know I'm going to do eight to 10 transactions from this, from my sphere of influence. I know I'm going to do eight to 10 transactions from repeat business. I'm looking for a coach to help me get another eight to 10 transactions. Now you see, they've reached the point where they know their pipeline, right? They know that if they do certain things with their database, they're going to get certain results. And that puts you in a better position to plan. Right, because now you know you add 100 people to your database, what effect that's likely to have on your business. And then momentum is when people start calling you. I've been in real estate too long, maybe a long, let's just say a long time. I always like it when I'm talking to other agents and they tell me how long they've been in the business, right? Like that matters. Like I've been a broker for 14 years, you know, things like that. And I'm, I'm, I always say, oh, you're new. Well, that's that's the you're kind of new. I can remember the first time my phone rang and a guy said, "Hi, do you remember that me? You sold my wife and I a home four years ago. We want to sell it and buy something else. When can you come over and talk to us?" And I was like, "Wow, <laughs> they're calling me, right? You understand? When that starts to happen, you're into momentum, and momentum allows you to generate money." which would allow you more options in terms of developing systems, technology, expanding, that sort of thing. And mastery, I'm not doing the, um, you know, the, um, the steps to mastery, Maslow's, I'm not going to do that. But mastery means that you're doing things without really even thinking about it, right? Um, and by the way, what is the biggest impediment to mastering the real estate business, the biggest impediment. And the answer is, it is the boredom that comes from repetitive behavior, right? That's the biggest, the boredom that comes from repetitive behavior. A typical football quarterback, my, like Tom Brady, Right. I used to, I'm so old, I used to use Joe Montana as an example, but you know, I'm tired of, you know, snotty millennials saying, who's that? Right. So I don't, I, you know, so Tom Brady probably spends 60 hours a week practicing, but only touches the ball for about 12 minutes in a game, 60 hours of practice for touching a ball for 12 minutes. Right. And so the mastery means that you have routines that you follow that you practice and you do the same thing over and over again. I remember watching, this was at a, a Keller Williams event. They had the number one team in KW, the number one guy, right? Who became later the CEO of, of Keller Williams and then now is no longer there, right? Um, has gone elsewhere. And he was being asked by Gary Keller um, number one team, right? And they asked him what his role was on the team. And this is a guy that would have made, his name was Chris Heller, right? He would have made a great undertaker, right? He had that dead pan, emotionless look on his face. And he's looking at the, you know, thousands of people waiting to hear his answer. And he said, I do what my calendar says I'm supposed to do every day. That's it, that was his answer to having the top team. He did what his calendar said that he was supposed to do. And one of the, one of the things that I learned that success in real estate is not so much about selling real estate as it is about following a schedule. Success is oftentimes more about following a schedule and a lot of people react negatively to that because I'm an independent contractor, right? I get to do what I want. I get to be creative. But that's what holds people back sometimes for mastery. All right, enough about, enough, enough of that. Step one would be goals. It would be good to have them. 
I realize that when you're brand new, goals are sometimes difficult because you don't even know if you're going to like the business or how long you're going to be in the business or if you're going to survive in the business. And so sometimes people say, I don't know, I just want to survive. I just want to see if I can make it to the end of the year. But there's this has been a, a, an often quoted study that was done by the Harvard MBA program where they were looking at MBA students as they graduated and only 3% of the students had written goals. Only 3%. Leaving the, Stan, the, the Harvard MBA program um, with plans to accomplish them. 13% had goals, but they hadn't written them anywhere. And 84% had no goals at all. Sounds like real estate to me, maybe a little bit. After 10 years, the 13% who had goals but did not write them down earned twice as much as the 84% who had no goals. The 3% who had written goals were earning on average 10 times as much as the other 97% of the people in the class combined. Um, people who don't write down their goals tend to fail at a hard, higher rate than people that have goals and write them down. And you could extend that to, are your goals someplace where you could see them? Are they, you know, in the bathroom mirror? Are they, you know, um, if you have a work area, do you, you look at them? Um, I'm not gonna do vision boards and things like that, but the agents who make the most money in real estate generally have goals, they've defined the goals, and they have a plan to reach the goals. And that's why we're here, isn't it? Isn't that what we're doing? So um, why would you wanna write them down? It's a reminder. It can bring your vision into reality. One of the questions, one of the, you know, how you get these things that you can put on the wall, the, you know, that are little sayings, you know, to inspire you. And one of the ones I recommend is, does my schedule reflect my goals, right? Does, does my schedule reflect my goals? Um, what kinds of goals? Why do you own a business? How many of you are, confused by the phrase owning a business. I'm a real estate agent, um, but you have your own business. So one of the things you might want to think about if you had big goals is what goals do you have that would affect your lifestyle? Right? How much money would you like to make to have the car you want to drive, the house you want to live in, the vacations you want to take? How about investment? How many of you, what is the retirement plan in real estate? Now, in some offices, there's actually revenue sharing and things that you can get even when you stop selling real estate. But for most people in real estate, retirement means investing in real estate. That's what it means. Because there may be a time when we don't want to work anymore or can't work anymore. And the question is, are our investments sufficient to maintain the lifestyle that we've set for our goals? You, how many of you are getting the idea this is gonna be a really big number by the, time, by the time we get through? And if you have debts that you need to pay off, and even you could look at, how about this? Income taxes is a debt you have to pay off, right? So the goals should reflect how much money do you have to make in order to pay your taxes, be able to make investments and way and to fund your lifestyle? Now, um, one of the things I'm going to zip around a little bit, I've given you some um, printed copies of this. There's a um, spreadsheet, which I think has been shared with everybody. If you haven't gotten it yet, send me an email. This isn't that complicated. But one of the things that you might want to look at is what are your actual hard costs of living? Assuming you wanted real estate to be what you do, how much money would you need to make in order to cover your lifestyle, right? And I'm not going to go through the line items are pretty self-explanatory. And then the question is, um, there is another question. Um, how about business, 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 all right, how about this? And there's also one related to the business. And I have another spreadsheet I'm going to show you 
which can sort of put some of these things together. But do you have a marketing budget? How many of you realize you have to pay fees just to be in real estate? Right, real estate can be an expensive hobby, right? When you pay the MLS, the board dues, the super key, all of the other little things that come up, your expenses, all of the stuff. Um, yeah, so if you're having, generally I found people have a good idea of how much money they would like to make, right? Without having to fill out any spreadsheets or forms. So let's figure out what the goals are. We're gonna write them down make sure you you know you write them down and one of the and, and i have a, a couple of these but this is just an example um you could write your own numbers to the side if you send me five dollars i'll send you a blank version of it or even if you just send me an email but let's say you've decided your number is three hundred thousand dollars right not a bad number right um what is your average sales price Right. Some of you are probably familiar with this sort of an exercise. Let's say you sell cheap homes in Santa Clara County, right? starter homes. So your median price is a million dollars, right? Cheap houses. And what would your average commission be? Now, depending on where you're at, it could be 70%, 80%. I saw a, a study. Some of the real estate companies are, are publicly traded. Rheology is publicly traded. Rheology, if you're not familiar, is the company that owns Cobo Banker and Century 21 and ERA and Better Homes and Gardens and Sotheby's and the Cochrane Group and Climb Realty and Zip Realty. And they own title companies, Cornerstone Title and others, and they own the Cardiff Relocation Company. And looking at their public statements, commission that goes in versus commission that goes back to the agents. 75% on average at a rheology company, I rattled off that list, the average is 75%. Compass, also publicly traded, um, the average commission to an agent was 80%. And by the way, EXP is publicly traded and the average commission is over 90%, which is saying, right? Just saying. So you're gonna need to know what that number is. Now, again, this can be more complicated because if you're brand new, your first few transactions, you have somebody helping you. Um, EXP, Keller Williams have caps, which means once you reach a certain amount, you get 100%. So it changes, but what would be your average commission split, right? I used a low number of 70%, right? But that obviously would change. Well, that would mean you would need 18 sales, right? at a, if you're getting a two and a half percent side. Now, if you're one of the agents and there's nothing, no shame in this, that gives rebates to buyers and things like that, the question is, what is your average commission side? Right, uh, I do it, right? I'll admit, but you know, what is your average commission side? What is your average commission split? And it, for many people, it's not quite two and a half percent, right? Not always two and a half percent. So we now know how many transactions we're going to need to close, given our average commission side and our median price point in order to reach our goal of 300,000. So do all contracts close? They don't always close. Sometimes the sale doesn't go through, the buyer doesn't buy, the seller doesn't sell. Most of the time in our market, when transactions are falling through, it's on the buyer side more than the seller side, but let's assume that 10% of your transactions fall out, right? You should buffer, put that in. So that would mean nine, we need 20 pendings in order to get 18 closed transactions. How about that? So the next metric, and one of the things that, that is useful to do is to back up the process. And by the way, if you don't like fancy goal setting, how about one a month? Right? This is what people say, well, I don't know. I don't even want to go through this process of figuring out my expenses and everything. How about one a month? Right? Is that, that's an easy number to remember. Just one, that's all we ask. One lousy little closing every month, right? Now, given a median price of a million dollars with a 2.5% side being $25,000, 
if you did one a month, 12 of those transactions, that would be, what is that? $300,000 in gross income. Um, so does what precedes the closed transaction, the open transaction is an agreement, right? Now that would on the listing side be more obvious. It's a listing agreement. If it's the buyer side, I realize not everybody has a buyer representation agreement. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But in order to have a transaction, you need to have a client. So let's say you met with four clients. You had four appointments with buyers, sellers, or investors. The question is how many of them are going to actually buy, sell, or invest? Um, let's say that, or, or commit to you and sign an agreement. Let's say half of the people, I'm gonna combine these two together. Let's just assume you're gonna need four appointments to get two people to sign an agreement to close a transaction. You need four appointments to close a transaction. If you wanna close 12 transactions in a year, then that means you're gonna need 48 appointments, four times 12. That comes out to be one appointment a week, which doesn't really sound like heavy lifting. For 48 weeks, you get to take a month off. You're in real estate, isn't that right? You take a month off. Most real estate agents take, what is it? The Halloween to Super Bowl vacation. Isn't that the typical real estate agent vacation, right? Around Halloween, Thanksgiving is when it starts, right? Super Bowl, Valentine's Day is when they start again, right? Um, just kidding, but you, you see where we're going. One of the metrics that you ought to be watching is how many appointments do you have every week? How many appointments do you have every month? By the way, there's then the question is going to be how many people do you have to talk to in order to get an appointment? Now that's going to vary depending upon who you're talking to and how good of a talker you are. If you're talking to repeat and referral business, it may not require as many talks as conversations as somebody that you don't already know. But let's say you need 50 conversations to create an appointment. And you need four appointments to close a transaction. What that would break down to is that you need to have 10 conversations a day, five days a week, right? and do that in order to produce the appointment a week, in order to produce the transaction a month, in order for you to buy a Tesla at the end of the year. Isn't that, the, isn't that what our goals always are, right? To get a new one, a new Tesla, another Tesla. So then we're gonna talk, well, how, who do you talk to? We're going to, we're going to talk about that. Um, is there one of the other things I wanted to do? All right, one of the other things that I'm going to just show you this is a worksheet that I put together a while ago. I think I made it a little too big. Um, I put in $30,000 or $300,000. And this is a spreadsheet, right? For those of you that like spreadsheets. Does your company have a company dollar cap? AXP has a cap of $16,000 for a solo agent. Agents on teams have an $8,000 cap. If you're at Keller Williams, your cap is probably around thirty to forty thousand, depending upon which office you're at. Right, thirty-three at some, forty-five at some. It all depends. Twenty-eight at some. And what a cap means is that when you've given that much money in company dollars, you don't have to give any more company dollars that year. If you don't have, if you're at a company that like Century Twenty One, Coldwell Banker, Compass, and Tarot right, where you just pay and pay and pay and pay, right, you would delete the cap. But the nice thing that I liked about Keller Williams and about EXP is, is that you don't just pay and pay and pay and pay. After a certain amount, you cap and you don't pay anymore, right? So if that's not where you're at, give me a call. We ought to talk. But otherwise, take out the cap. So the other thing to think about is I'm going through this form and you don't, I, I, I've shared the spreadsheet with everybody, I believe, right? I've emailed it because I don't know how to give the spreadsheet, you know, um, in, in a live session. But one of the things you ought to think about is, is your business buyer oriented or seller oriented? 
Now, a lot of times brand new agents are working with buyers more than they're working with sellers because they perceive that that's going to be easier. That's not always true, right? It's not always true, but they perceive it to be easier. And the reason sometimes it's easier when you're working with a buyer is because, and you're new and you don't know exactly what you're doing is buyers buy something tangible, right? They buy a house and they don't really care about you, right? If you got lost getting to the house because your GPS wasn't working, it took you 20 minutes to open the lock box because you'd never done it before and you have to call somebody and ask them how to do it. How do you get the key out, right? I've done everything, it made a noise, but nothing's happened. How do I get the key out, right? And they're watching you, your clients are watching you struggle to open the door, right? Finally, you open the door and as you're walking in, you trip and fall you know, flat on your face in the hallway, bleeding on the floor, right? And the buyers step over you. They might say, you okay, right? They look at the house. They like the house. You've probably made a sale, right? You understand as they're taking you out to the EMT, you know, they'll say, we want to make an offer on this one. Let us know when you're out, right? You understand? Because they're not, they don't care about you as much as they care about the house. Sellers, on the other hand, could be different because when the seller lists their home, they don't get a tangible result. What they get is your promise to provide a service at some point in the future, right? And so because of that difference, many times new agents are drawn towards buyers, which isn't a bad idea necessarily because those buyers are going to be sellers, hopefully at some point in time. But it, how many of you ever heard the old line, you have to list to last in real estate, right? You have to list to last. And the reason that everybody says stuff like that is that the amount of time it takes to represent a seller is significantly less than the amount of time it takes to represent a buyer. At the peak when I was selling real estate, primarily as an agent, I was still doing other things. I had 15 listings at one point. And um, I played, I, 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 I was in a sport. I went twice a week. I never missed an appointment. Um, I would go away on the weekends because the buyer's agents were showing my listings and new agents were doing the open houses, right? And I would come back and there would be offers. You could have 15, 20 listings and it wouldn't kill you. Five buyers might kill you, right? Five motivated, eager buyers could be more than you could handle on any one weekend. Do you understand the, the leverage of sellers is significantly higher? So now the question is, in your business, where do you want it to be? Mostly buyers or mostly sellers, right? Because it'll affect our plan. So in this, what I always would recommend when I was coaching people is your goal ought to be to have at least 60% of your business to come from listings and maybe 40% of the business to come from buyers. By the way, if you have a lot of listings, you don't have to pay Zillow for buyers, right? If you have a lot of listings, because the buyers will call you without, the, without you having to pay for it. So breaking that down, you can see the spreadsheet then calculates what is the amount of income we're going to need from listings versus the amount of income from buyers. I put in the average listing price, sales price. Sometimes agents have a different sales price when they represent a buyer than a list price when they represent a seller. It's okay. I'm not gonna say whose phone that is going off. Um, it's okay. Go ahead. It's okay. If, if, if people's phones going off in, in rooms when I'm talking bothered me, I would have to do something else, right, for a living. <laughs> So um, sometimes people find when they're looking at their numbers that their average buy side is smaller than their average listing side, right? They tend to list homes that are more expensive than the, see, if your buyers are first time home buyers, that's different perhaps in terms of the dollar amount. But anyhow, for purposes of clarity, I just made it the same. What is the average commission? I put in two and a half percent, but again, you might know that yours would be different. Um, what is your average gross commission? I put in, let's say you're on an 80-20 split. That's where the 80% came from. 
right? If that's a higher split or a lower one, you would put that in. The average company dollars that would be paid on this transaction would be $5,000, 20% of that amount. And as we go down, you're going to see I've, it's a similar thing. Notice I have a higher percentage of the listings closing than buyers closing. Because in our market, if you, unless you really screw it up, your listing should sell. Right. I'm not saying they all sell, but if we look at the statistics, we're in a market where 98% of the listings are selling. But that doesn't mean that 98% of the buyers actually buy something, right? The listings eventually sell. But I, so I have a different percentage. And then that would tell us how many listings and how many buyers. It breaks it down to how many we need a month. You're going to see it's kind of close. Um, how many appointments are we going to need depending upon our conversion rate? If you can convert 50% of your appointments, then you're only going to need 16 listing appointments. If your conversion rate is lower, you would need more. And you can see from this, the monthly appointments in this case is about two and a half to three appointments a month. One appointment a week. If you want to keep it simple, I want to close a transaction a month and I want to have an appointment a week. Those are easy numbers to remember, right? And if you had an appointment a week and you did that for 48 weeks, you would be selling real estate. If you had two appointments a week or three appointments a week, well, you get the idea. And so that gives us 12 units, right? Magically, it worked out to that number. Gross income would be 30,000. EXP is a $16,000 cap. You would take that out if you don't have it which means income before expenses is 284,000. Now, what are the operating expenses? That's what's over here, right? And I forget if I put them in yearly, it computes monthly. I, there, there's a little wonkiness in this, this, but you get the idea. What are your realtor dues going, what are, what are they? 675 a year for the Association of Realtors, 850 roughly for the multiple listing service, about $30 a month for the super key, right? You know, on any of those numbers sound, sound right. Um, and if we put in all of that stuff, equipment, other things, what we're going to do is come up with a, um, um, what we're doing is coming, somebody says they're having a panic attack. Um, yes, welcome to real estate. So if you, Add up all those things. Are, are you going to spend any money on marketing? Right? Are you going to have a marketing budget? Are you, if you're going to be doing geographic farming, are you doing internet lead generation? Right? We might want to figure out what all of the ways we're going to meet buyers and sellers of real estate, and is there an expense involved? And we can plug those in. And uh, what this nice little spreadsheet does is it puts the operating expenses down there. It tells us what the net income is and your hourly rate. The important part, lunch with the run. All right, so we're gonna, oops, wrong, 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 wrong. how about this? I hit the wrong button, all right. So a goal. Now, when the, we're gonna talk about how do we break down these goals into weekly and monthly increments? There's a difference between what's called a lead indicator and a lag indicator. A lag indicator would be a closed transaction, right? We don't have as much control over that as we might think. If I want to close transactions in 2021, they better be in escrow now. Understand if I, if I if they're not in escrow right now, there's a pretty good chance they're not going to close this year. So I can't really make a goal for closing transactions in November, not at this point in November, right? I really can't. But a lead indicator is something I have control over. Do I have control over how many people I talk to each day? Right? I have control over that. I have control over the things I do and the places I go and the people I see, that's a lead indicator. And sometimes it's more important to have our goals focus on those things rather than on the closed transactions. 
because I have a lot of agents that say, well, I don't know how many appointments I'm going to need in order to close the transaction. I don't know how many conversations I'm going to need to have an appointment. Well, why don't we set a goal for so many conversations a day? And after time, you're going to find out what your closing rate is. And then we can we can make adjustments. All right, the plan. Um, as I, I know you guys are all you know up on what's happening in real estate. And so you're probably all aware that the National Association of Realtors has recently, like last week, released their 2021 survey of home buyers and sellers, right? I'm, I'm sure you all were familiar with that. You already have your copy, right? And have read it thoroughly. Is that is that right? Is that right? Um, I have one. So what did and so when just to be clear, when they do a 2021 profile of home buyers and sellers, they're talking about 2020. Right? We're talking about the COVID year, right? So one of the things they asked is, and the reason I share this is because in the real estate business, this is our market research. What is it that buyers want from real estate agents? Now, the reason I think this is an important um, chart to look at, because when you're crafting marketing material, when you're putting together your value proposition, right? Don't you all have a written value proposition that you're ready to share with buyers and sellers? Isn't that right? Don't you have it? I can remember on a listing appointment when I was a new agent that the seller said to me, give me 10 reasons why I should work with you. I was like, oh, uh oh. Um, and I remember when I said number five, he said, you've already said that one. And I was like, oh. So um, I, I sat down and I made 10 reasons, right? So when you have a value proposition, what do they want? Them, they want you to help, they want you to help them find the home to buy. That probably isn't a surprise, but that's only 52%. So that's what they want most, 52%, right? Now, why isn't it a higher percentage? Because they've heard of Zillow. They know what Redfin is. They have Realtor.com. What's the next? They help negotiate the terms of the sale. What kind of negotiation skills do you have? Have you ever taken any classes in negotiation? Do you know how to negotiate in a real estate transaction? If you don't, that might be something that would help you get business. 11% want price negotiations, which is like the terms of the sale. Paperwork is eight. Determined comparables is six. How much the buyer can afford, 4%. Why isn't that higher? Because all of the websites have a click here, get pre-approved now. 3% is helping with financing, and you can see it goes down from there. Um, how did how do buyers find their agents? So if we're going to put together a plan on how you're going to find people that want to buy real estate, we might look at how are real estate agents and buyers meeting. Notice uh, what it says for all buyers, 47% referred by or is a friend, neighbor, or relative. Now, if you're wondering why real estate offices, companies, coaches, and trainers talk about working your sphere of influence, this is why. Notice for first-time buyers, it's even higher, 57%. Why? Because they don't have agents they've already worked with. Right? They're, they're, they're not repeating. And repeat buyers is a little, so almost half of the real estate business comes from sphere of influence. By the way, I would bet that in Silicon Valley, the percentage is higher, right? And the market, by the way, in Silicon Valley is different. I've had, I've been to trainings and they say, no, 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 everything's the same. It doesn't really matter. That's not true. I have, I coach, I have a production team at EXP that has 45 agents on it uh, in San Diego and Los Angeles and Sacramento and Contra Costa County. And I'm telling you, it's not the same. And one reason it's not the same in Silicon Valley, not quite the same, is because our price point is so high that there are lots of people that get their real estate license just hoping to have a friend, a neighbor, or relative work with them. A few years ago, the MLS, our MLS, said that over 60% of the members in the multiple listing service had not closed a real estate transaction in 12 months. 60% had not closed a transaction in 12 months. 
I have software, by the way, that analyze agents and productions and at almost all offices, the majority of the people is zeros, right? So why are they paying their dues? Because all they need is one family member to buy or sell a $2 million house and they're ahead of the game. Now, if you're in Oklahoma, right, or someplace like that, you got to do a lot more transactions in order to make money. So use the agents previously, that's 13%. We add those two together, we have 60% of all buyers are working with repeat or referral on a repeat or referral basis, 60% of all buyers right, are either working with somebody they already know or was referred to them or have worked with them before. Inquired by uh, about a property online, 7%. Went to a website, 7%. Saw information on an open house sign, 5%. This is why if you have listings, you don't need to spend as much money on marketing because, you know, people will call you. Visited, uh, referred by another broker, 5%. One of the things you might want to think about in your plan is do you have as part of your plan that you're going to reach out to brokers that might refer business to you? Do you read articles when you see them on the internet about where people are moving to from our area? So do people move to Texas? Not entirely sure why, but they do, right? So they move to Texas. How many Texas brokers do you have relationships with that might refer you business? Visited an open house and met the agent 4%. That percentage, by the way, it goes from four to five, depending upon the year, but it's somewhat consistent. Personal contact by agent, telephone, email, et cetera, 3% of the buyer said that they met their agent because the agent contacted them. You'll note, those of you that go through my sessions know I'm not pushing, you know, the cold calling as I'm, I don't push cold calling, right? Because statistically speaking, it's not a high percentage. This is buyers. You might say, well, show us the seller. It's coming, right? It may be higher. Uh, walked into an office and talked to an agent on duty. I don't know who does that anymore, right? This isn't the 1980s, right? You know, but that's 1%. By the way, this is one of the, one of the things I see is agents. There is an agent that I'd met and he'd gone to in tarot in Las Gatos. And I asked him, why did you go to Intero in Los Gatos? And he said, well, I want to sell Los Gatos properties, right? And now, I, I be, just to play dumb, I say, well, why is that? Even though I think we all know why he would rather sell, because they're expensive. Do you live in Los Gatos? No. Do you know anybody in Los Gatos? No. no. No, I don't. How long have you been at the office? A year. How many transactions have you done? None. None, right? You understand just sitting in the Intero office in Los Gatos does not mean that people are going to walk in and say, hey, you, I want to sell my house, right? You understand? Or buy a house. This is a statistically insignificant. Um, saw your social media page. How many of you have paid for social media marketing, right? Signed up with those companies that post stuff for you. If you, if you follow me, you see, I, I do. Right? I, I post keeping current matters stuff. I've been doing it for years. Do you know how many calls I've gotten from people based on those posts? You know, how many transactions I've done because I, of that? You know, um, and statistically, it's you know a small percent. Um, how about this? How many real estate agents did a typical buyer talk to before they decided to work with the agent? Notice that 73% of all the buyers essentially interviewed to talk to one real estate agent, 73%. So it's sometimes whoever gets there first, um, after we get through these slides, Annalisa, you'll be just, you know, because I they know I can see they keep looking in the back. <laughs> When's he going? Is a minute. All right. 73% of the time they work with the first agent they talk to, right? This is why getting to people early in the process, fishing upstream. This is something I talk to people that I'm coaching, fishing upstream. Now, fishing upstream means getting referrals from people that get that connection before everyone else does. Who might be somebody 
that a buyer would talk to before a real estate agent? Annalisa, can you think of anybody that a buyer might talk to before a real estate agent? Yes, I'm, it's called financing. It's called a lender, right? So the first thing they do is they walk into Wells Fargo. They, they've got an account there. They find the person and they talk to them about it, right? So if we can get CPAs, financial advisors, lenders, you understand that's upstream. If we wait too long, and we're we're fishing downstream it means that those fish have to pass a lot of hooks right before they get to arms um what how about this what's the most important factor that a buyer had in picking their real estate agent is it the office you work for is it your name badge the logo on your business cards according to the survey only one percent of the buyers cared about who the company was that the agent worked for why because buyers buy houses right they don't by the way if i'm on a listing appointment and by and i in or a recruiting appointment i got this other day somebody saying well you know you guys don't have as many signs in our neighborhood right so a seller when what do you do when a seller says well Compass, Intero, Cobalt Banker, they have all the listings in our neighborhood. Um, why should I list with you? What I always do is I ask them, do you remember when you bought this house, right? 10 years ago, whenever it was, why did you buy this house? Tell me why you bought this house. And they're gonna say what they're gonna say. And by the way, they never mentioned the name of the listing agent or the company that listed the home. And after they've given me their reasons for buying the house, I ask them, do you remember who the listing agent was when you bought this house? Right. And I haven't had anyone recently remember that listing agent's name. One of them said, Linda, I think. Right. Do you remember what company Linda worked for? Coldwell Banker, maybe it was a blue sign. Wasn't it a blue sign? So then I would say, well, what effect? Explain to me how Linda and Coldwell Banker got you to buy this house explain how that happened and of course they blink and shake their head and say they have nothing to do with it isn't that right they have nothing to do with it so buyers don't care do they about the listing agent they only care about the house they also don't care where you work what do they care about reputation of the agent repeat and referral business agent is honest and trustworthy agents experience Family member, 13%. Knowledge of the neighborhood, 8%. You see the, the and so you might want to work some of this in also when you're developing marketing materials. Um, what about agent skills? What are they looking for? Honesty and integrity. Responsiveness. You'll see a lot of studies on this. If you don't call back quickly, they're gonna call somebody else. Isn't that right? They call you and you don't call them back. I taught a class one time. Somebody left me a message at the beginning of the class. She wanted, she and her husband were going to list their home with me. By the end of the class, I called them and they said, uh, we, we called another agent. We just called another. This is why I have a full-time assistant. <laughs> Calls people when they leave me messages. Knowledge of the purchase process, knowledge of the market, communication skills, negotiation skills, people skills knowledge of the local area, technology. This is what they're looking for. Um, and communications, how do agents communicate? 74% want calls personally to inform me of activities. Now I realize in our area, there are people that just want to um, be texted, right? But people want phone calls apparently, they want you to send them listings. They want you information by text message at 71%. Emails, notice it drops. Market reports, it drops. Has a website, 29%. I have buyer's agents who don't have websites. All right, they don't have a website. All right, why do they need a website? All right, no one's going to, do people go to the website to search for homes anymore? Right? You know, buyers, they, they go to Zillow, they go to Redfin, they go to realtor.com um you you get the you get the idea um why don't would they use the agent again 75 percent of buyers in the 2021 survey said they would use the agent again how many of the buyers recommended the agent 36 percent said none 
is how many times they recommended their agent. Once was 16%, twice was 18%, three times is four or more times 20%. One of the advantages of working with buyers is that they're here, right? Most sellers that I've represented leave the area, right? Most sellers I've represented in the San Jose area leave the San Jose area when they sell their home because they're moving away. But buyers are here. And if you do a good job and you follow up, that means a customer relationship management system. It means having a database. It means following up. It means calling them. It means so that they don't forget who you are. You could get 20% got four or more referrals, right? Which is they followed up. Um, selling a house. And then after a couple of these, we'll take a, a just a teensy break. Um, 80% of the 90% of the sellers used an agent. Um, 1% first tried to sell it themselves and then used an agent. For sale by owners were about 7%. Right? We don't have as many of them as you would think, right? For 7%. How did the average seller? typical seller find their real estate agent. 39% was referred by a friend, a neighbor, or relative, right? It's 41% for buyers, 39% for sellers. 29% had used the agent before. 70% of sellers are working with repeat or referrals for picking their agent, 70% of sellers. Personal contact by agent, 4%. Referred 4%, internet website 3 visited an open house 2%, that's gone down. But the reason I'd like to share this with you is because, you know, what systems actually work? Where are the connections actually being made? A number of agents contacted before selecting one, 82% of sellers said they only talked to one agent, 82%. So this is why we emphasize sphere of influence and, and your repeat business, past clients. This is why we emphasize it, because 82% of the time, they're only going to talk to you. 2% uh, talk to five or more agents. I've been on those appointments where they said, we're talking to you and five others. Give me your presentation. Um, what is the service? Most of the sellers had a broad range of services. That means a full service listing. A small percent had like 86% full service, 8% was limited service, and 6%, which is actually down, is they just did, uh, these were the discount brokers that just listed on the MLS. What do sellers want? They want you to help them price the property. They want you to market the property. They want you to do it in a specific time frame. They want advice on how to fix it up, finding a buyer, helping with negotiation. This is the list of things that I would talk about when I was putting together my value proposition. And what is the most important factor in picking an agent if you're a seller? Reputation, trustworthiness, family member, uh, that sometimes those contradict the honest and trustworthiness, but we won't go there. Knowledge of the neighborhood, 11%. You get the idea. A good listener, 5%. Notice commission is 4%. Now, again, the, our market may be a little bit different than that, right? Because my, my experience has been it's more than that. Um, why don't we... What I would like to do, and this is negotiating the commission, the flat fee, and would you use the agent again? And how many times would you recommend the agent? And how many times did you actually recommend the agent? Again, it's similar numbers. 74% said they would recommend the agent, but the reality is often less than that. So what I'd like to do now is have Annalisa come up and explain what all that stuff is in the back. And and then if you guys want to, can they just go, why don't you just go and get something right now while, while Annalisa is explaining. Hi everyone, thank you, Michael. How are you? Good. Good. How's everyone today? Good. I like small and intimate groups. 
So let me introduce myself. My name is Anna Chong Lopez. I am with Wells Fargo at the Sunnyvale branch. Um, I'm a sales manager. My branch actually they, um, is under a branch manager by the name of David Baker. We had funded $3.5 billion already in September. It is probably the biggest funding for any branch manager of Wells Fargo. We're probably right now number one. So when I say that, it's really important for a realtor to know when they work with loan officers or any lending officer that is really understanding, you know, where you work with is how you're going to get your services. And the reason I say that is really important. How many of you guys are in contracts right now? So with your contract, how many days did you have to close? It was a new construction, so takes a little, it, it, it takes took a, I mean, it wasn't the 30 days, it was like right. six months. Right. So, so I, and the reason I ask um, is, oh, oh, okay. 40 people online. So. Well, hello, everyone online. It's going to be a little awkward. It's hybrid. 25 days. About 25 yeah, days. For the ones that are not new construction. Yeah, so you're right. Usually in a market like this, such as really the seller's market, they want to close fast, they want to get it done, and they want to move on, especially on the fourth quarter, right? So um, just a couple of uh, information. When we have a credit approval, which you'll hear a lot with when you talk to brokers or lenders or any correspondent, is that credit approval will, can get your loan closes 17 to 21 days because it's already underwritten by an underwriter. And then if it's just a regular pre-approval, some offices will tell you 30 days or 25. Our office typically is 25 days. That's gonna be a huge advantage for you, especially if you're doing a buyer's consultation, right? Or even seller's consultation, you can tell them, you know, this is the range. The reason why I'm telling you all this is because fourth quarter, it's, you know, it's the slowest quarter, but however, I've noticed for the last two years, we are still very busy. And I love how Michael had said it earlier, that you do need a great team of lenders, title people to get more business, right? So my suggestion is if you don't have three different lenders to work with, go find them. Because it is very important that not every one lender will have all the niches. And it's, I can't say I have every niche, it, it won't be true. But if you have three lenders to partner with, they are backed up with a team for you to leverage up the names and also the fact that the team behind you is going to work with your consumer, right? And also your, you know, wonderful title company who's sitting right behind there, Chicago Title with Lynn, great resources for you to get more business. So I say this because it's important that, you know, as agents and you're learning all the steps and what, you know, consumer wants they want experience and truthfulness, and it's all about subject matter. And if you're able to give them the resources, they will entrust you a lot more. So with that said, I don't want to preach, but um, you know, we're here to help you. I have my business card in the back. It can talk to you more about loans and specific programs. But most importantly is you want to have lunch. So there's great uh, selections in the back. Please have lunch. I'm around to answer any questions you have. And I'm so sorry for those of that's online. Come next time in person so you can have lunch because there's a lot of it. So um, please take some time and I can answer any questions if you have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. How long it takes to order an appraisal? <laughs> For it depends on county. So county is all over America. So Santa Clara right now is from eight days to 16 days for a single pack. Right. Uh, Alameda, I want to say is two days additional. But it's also based on the property. So if the property is a little unique, it might take longer. We uh, specialize in making sure that even when we rush, we don't charge the customer a rush fee, which is really important. Because right now, for some lenders, they're charging up to $2,000 and they're passing it on to the client because of the rush. Our maximum is $895. Anything beyond that, we will tip the cost. And we have a huge, um, AMC, that's what they're known, which are different appraisal companies that work with us and the volume that we pull, they're pretty responsive, but it's really hit and miss. Yeah. Yeah. I just got the call. <laughs> I had a transaction recently where the appraisal was almost $7,000. It was complicated. It was, a, it was an expensive house. Complicated. What was the price point? Uh, it was $5 million, but it was complicated. So, um, and by the way, if you're 
and and I also want to introduce Lynn Dang back there in the in the corner. That's she's with Chicago Title. Um, you know, a lot of times it's about the people you know and work with. The what I would say to a buyer: Can we send her contact information for those online? Yes, Danny, we will um, send everybody that is registered her contact information, right? So that you can. So if I'm talking to a buyer. I always would say to a buyer, you ought to talk to three lenders, right? I would I would generally say that. One, you ought to talk to a bank. You know, if you've got your money in the bank, you might want to talk to a bank because the big banks have different loans, right? Wells Fargo is the number one lender in California, I believe, right? Um, number two, you might talk to a credit union if you are a member of a credit union. And number three, you might want to talk to a mortgage company. Now, having done that, I usually direct them. I would say, well, why don't you talk to Wells Fargo first, right? Or whoever it is that you're working with Prime to see where it goes, right? Because they have different loans, right? And not the, the you should at least have one of each, right? And anyhow, um, so you got, I'm surprised you haven't, you know, crushed each other getting the food. There's food in the back, get up, really get it, guys. right? Okay. Go ahead. I have vegetarian in mind and everything. Right. Please, I ordered a lot. I, I've never seen bashful real estate agents <laughs> when it came to food. I've never seen that before. All right. So while we're doing that, and those of you online, you know, it's your turn. You can have a snack. So while we're doing that, what are the things about budgeting time, scheduling? Yeah. It's, how many hours are you working in real estate full time? Part time? Big time? There, I'm. Uh, let's give everybody a minute or two. To... All right. Full time and big time, all the time. I didn't realize it was an in-person event. I would have come. I think I mentioned that in the emails. And by the way, I had in great big red letters, lunch will be provided. Because usually that's what is needed to get agents to show up. Not enough time. <laughs> Hopefully I'll have one I can take with me when I'm gone, when we're done. I think we have a few. All right. So those of you that you know are online don't see the um, the filet mignon, the rotisserie going in the back. I don't know. So let's assume that you're doing real estate full time. You're a full-time real estate agent. How many hours would that mean? Let's just say we're doing a 40-hour work week. Now, if you're doing a 40-hour work week, let's say you don't have any escrows right now. You don't have enough clients. What is the number one thing that a real estate salesperson should be doing if they don't have enough clients? And my suggestion, it would be getting more clients. Would it be a fair statement that if you don't have enough clients, that maybe you ought to spend 80% of your time getting clients? How about that? If you don't have enough clients. So if you're working a 40 hour work week and you spend 80% of your time trying to get doing the activities to have clients that would be 32 hours a week 32 hours is 80 percent of 40 hours and if you divided that by five days it means that you would be spending 6.4 hours every day getting clients wow that sounds awful doesn't it uh, you know how about this we're in real estate right isn't that why we're in real estate so we don't have to punch a time clock so let's just let's just 
lower the bar a little bit. How about 20 hours a week, right? Can you devote 20 hours a week to the real estate business? And if you don't have clients and you're working 20 hours a week, you might want to spend 80% of your time getting clients. And if you're spending 80% of your 20 hours a week, that's 16 hours a week is the amount of time you would spend getting clients. And if you divide that by five, it's 3.2 hours a day. If we round down, it's three, let's round it down to three hours a day. Three hours a day of lead generating activity. Now, some people don't like the word prospecting, right? It's like a four letter word. Isn't there, what's, you know what the four letter word is? Work, right? Doesn't that sound, it sounds awful, doesn't it? So we don't all like the word prospect. Not everybody likes the phrase lead generation. People don't always like that phrase either. Why don't we call it, if you want to rebrand it, appointment setting activity. So to me, a lead generation activity is any activity that you are doing that could result in an appointment with a buyer, seller, or an investor. So if we were, if we were had an 80% focus of a 20 hour week, we would be spending three hours a day on lead generation and appointment setting activities. I've had people that I coached tell me, well, I'm leaving. I had this one guy say to me, he said, I've done everything you've asked and it didn't work. And I'm like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. <laughs> you know, most real estate agents don't spend three hours a week on lead generating activities. Some don't spend three hours a month on lead generating activities, right? They're waiting for the real estate gods to just drop escrows from the sky. You know, I, I don't know, you know, um, but real estate sales is based upon something that you actually do. So when we get down to time blocking, the 80-20 rule, you may be familiar with this rule, right? The 80-20 rule was, it's called Pareto's principle. Pareto was an Italian economist, and he had noticed that 20% of the people in Italy had 80% of the wealth. He also had a garden, and in his garden, he had pea pods. And being the analytical type, he had determined that 20% of his pea pods produced 80% of his peas. So he started looking for the ratio, the 80-20 ratio. Now, what that means in real estate to start with is 20% of the agents make 80% of the money. Actually, it's more like 90-10, right? It's more like 90-10. It also means that if we were to make a list of everything a real estate agent could do, should do, ought to do, if we made a list of all of the functions of a real estate agent, by the way, I have such a list. It's a big spreadsheet, goes on for a while. If we made a list of all of the activities of real estate agents could do, 20% of the things that are on that list produce 80% of our income. 20% of the things we do produce 80% of our income. By the way, 80% of the problems that real estate agents have come from 20% of the mistakes they make, right? So a question is, when you're doing something, are you doing something that's in your 20%? This is the difference between being busy and being productive. If I do eight things and you do two things, which of us is ahead? And the answer is it all depends on which eight I'm doing and which two you're doing. This is why some agents have the saying, does my schedule reflect my goals? And if I see, if I'm coaching agents and they're putting together labels on flyers and things like that, or postcards to mail out, I might ask them, is this your 20%? Is, this, is that your 20%, right? So, um, yeah, usually the result, the, usually the problem is we're not spending enough time doing the right things. Right. That might be 
that might be the issue. Let's, so what are the dynamics of a expanding sphere of influence? Let's say you made a commitment that you're going to meet 10 new people every day. Right now, we're going to talk about where you would go and what you would do and what you might say to meet people. But your goal is to meet 10 people every day. And you're going to do that five days a week and you're going to do it 50 weeks a year. Right? Even during the holidays. That's your goal. Well, 50 per week times 50 weeks is 2,500 people that you would have met if you met 10 people a day. You know, if we assume that people are selling every 15 years, and I see the averages, people sell every seven to 10 years, not in our area. And by the way, it would depend on whether or not they own a condo, a town home, a median priced home or a luxury home. Right. I sold a $3.9 million house to a buyer a couple of months ago. When do you think they plan on selling that house? Long, long time from now. Right. You understand this is a long time. You sell somebody a condo. When do they want to sell it? As soon as they can. But let's say on the average, people are selling every or buying every 15 years. That means that from our 10 people a day, that would constitute 166 transactions. 166 is the number of transactions from that group. And let's say we're not good at it. Let's say we're not good at it. And that 90% of those people are not going to work with us. Right? We'll lose 90% of them because we're just not good at following up. We're not good talkers. They don't like us. That's still 16 transactions. 16 transactions. So the lead indicator is how many people are you talking to every day? By the way, in a different life, I used to work for a company that sold photocopiers. This is real sales, right? You understand real sales. And by real sales, I mean we had to turn in a piece of paper every day that uh, answered the questions, how many calls did you make? How many conversations did you have? How many appointments did you set? How many appointments did you go on? How many photocopiers did you sell? Every day you had to turn it in. And by the way, if you turned in zeros, you soon were not working for the company. Now, because we're independent contractors, we're not doing this. By the way, I do have a coaching program um, I, where some people are interested in um, accountability. That also sounds bad, doesn't it? Achievability. How about that? Achieve, does that sound better? Achievability. And what I know, and by the way, when I was um, at Keller Williams as a productivity coach, I paid $1,000 a month for a coach. The coach that I paid for, this is out of my own pocket, $1,000 a month, the coach only coached people that coached people. You understand? It was a specialized thing. She coached coaches. That was the whole idea. And by the way, if I said, this is what I'm going to do next week, she would look at my calendar, which I had shared with her, and she would say, I don't see it. And one of our mantras was, if it's not in the calendar, it doesn't exist. So when, where, and we're gonna to get to calendaring, when during the week do I plan on talking to people? Right? When do I plan on doing that? So what are the things that we need to do? We're talking about database now. Do you have one? If you don't, you should get one. What does that mean? Are there people in your cell phone, people in your email, friends on Facebook? I, you know, I have to laugh when I say that. LinkedIn connection, right? Instagram people, some of them you don't really know, but the first step is to get everybody that you know together in one place. Now, by the way, if you aren't at a company like eXp that gives you a separate database so you don't have to worry about the company peeking at it, I made a video which is on my website on how to use free Google products to maintain a database. Free Google products. And some of them cost a little bit. My system that I use for sending out emails, and by the way, all of you that got emails about this event got an email from that system. And it's sometimes embarrassing when I log in because it shows that I've sent out like 350,000 emails. I'm not kidding, right? Out of the system, there is a fee for that email system. It's $28 a year, a year. That's what I pay for the email client that sends out bulk emails. 
I also pay $6 a month for a Google Workplace account and $28 a year, and I can send out 1,500 emails every 24 hours, which is probably more than you need. You understand you need to have a database. And if you don't have, if you work for a company where they own the database and you don't want to do it and you want a free system to get started with, find my video on my YouTube channel on how to use free or almost free products and you could do it in Gmail. I know agents that carry around pieces of paper where they've written down the names, phone numbers, and they call people, right? It can be done. We actually used to sell real estate before computers. I know that sounds crazy. Some are, I may be the only one to re well, maybe not the only one to remember that, but uh, we used to sell this. So how many people do you have in your database? Do you have a hundred people? Do you have 50 people? By the way, your goal, if you don't have a hundred is to get to a hundred. How many people do you need in your database before you're starting to see significant results? And the answer is about 600. If you had, when you get to 2,000 and 2,500, it starts to work a lot better. So um, let's say you want to generate a 10% return from a database. Like, where do you want to go, All right? And we have some other forms about this. Let's say you your goal is to have 250 people in your database and you want to get a 10% return. Now, 10% doesn't mean that those 250 people are all, that 25 of them are going to buy, sell, or invest in real estate themselves but you could get a referral from them, right? So if you have 250 people in your database, your goal is to get a 10% return. By the way, studies that have been done elsewhere, they looked at what do you get if you sent somebody two emails a month that are in your database and you did that for a consistent period of time, what would your return be? And the answer is about four to five percent. If all you did is email people twice a month, four to five percent. If you call people and have a conversation with them, either on the phone or at coffee, at least once a quarter, the return jumps to five to seven percent. And if you have an in-person meeting like an event or something with them, once a year at least, it goes up to about 10%. Right. This comes from not only research done by Keller Williams, but a guy named Brian Buffini and another guy by the name of Joe Stump, right, which are referral based programs. So many agents are getting a 10% return on their database if they're doing it right. So let's say you have this is the gap. And what is your goal? Now, I've put in these numbers, but you, this is not a sophisticated form. Right, so do you have a goal for how many people you wanna put in your database? 500, 600 would be a good goal. How many do you have now? Let's say it's 100. How many do you need to add? 400, it got skewed when we, when we uh, converted this, I think, from Google to something else or back. So if you want to add 400 people in your database and you wanna do it in one year, you need to add 34 people each month. Isn't that right? I think that's right. 34 would be your monthly goal. So if we divided that by four, does everybody see if we were doing 10 a day, we're gonna blow that number away, right? 10 a day would be 50 a week, which would be 400 a month. So how many do we actually need every week? What's 34 divided by 4.3? I'm looking at Dimitri because um, 34 divided by 4.3. Anyhow, we don't need very many every week in order to get to 30 a month in order to get to um, the number we need to reach that goal. There are four laws of the database. You need to have one, whether it's a Google system, whether or not you're using Outlook. I guess you could do it with Outlook. You know, I'm, I, you know, I guess um, whether or not you bought Top Producer or Chime or KV Core or some system, you need to have one. You need to feed it every day. Every day, you should have a commitment that you're working to add people to your database. 
They could be vendors. They could be potential sellers. They could be potential buyers. They could be people in a geographic area. And then you need to communicate in a systematic way with the people that are in your database. The regularity of your communication will increase your rate of return from the database. Uh, follow-up boss, somebody says, yes, follow-up boss is a company that, that has nice programs. It works with um, Google, it can synchronize. Um, it doesn't do some of the things that real estate CRMs will do but there are a lot of programs. My suggestion again is, if you're not at a company that separates the CRM from them, get your own CRM, right? Because you may want to change companies at some time and you don't want to lose your database. And then you have to follow up with the leads that you get, follow up. So an annual touch program. This is down at the bottom is what I recommend that people do. You ought to have something, a newsletter that says what's going on in the real estate business. What's going on in the real estate market? How about that? You could have 12 holiday greetings. So if every month we do two things, we, we send our clients or potential clients something about what's happening in the real estate market. And then we also send them something about some holiday. Some months have more than one, some months not as many. There's always a weird one, but by that gives us something that we could follow up with them. You ought to have weekly coffee dates. One of the metrics people have said, well, how many times should I be doing this? You ought to, how about this, two times a day? You should be meeting with people having coffee. I know this is going to sound this insane for me to say, but some of you are not drinking enough coffee. I, I know that just sounds crazy, doesn't it? Right? People are like, I can't drink any more coffee. But you ought to be meeting with people twice a day, right? If you want a, a goal, and having coffee with them. I had recruited an agent that was a, a, a good producer and into a coaching program that I was doing. And she said that before, before she said to me to begin with, she said, well, give me one example of something that I could do right now that would increase my business. Just give me an example. You know, you're a coach. You ought to be able to give an example. I said, go through your database, pick out the top 50 people that are likely to refer you business and take them to lunch once a day, once a week for 50 weeks, go to lunch, once a week with somebody in your database and she said yeah that would probably work <laughs> do you think that would work if you had lunch with somebody in your database once a week coffee a few times a week coffee days um every quarter we ought to call people at least every 90 days you ought to find them on social media i don't think that posting stuff on social media is generally a appointment setting activity. So why are we doing it, right? And the answer is it's a way for us to follow up with our existing database. So when somebody that we have on our list, and I think I'm gonna talk about lists, there's different kinds of people in our database, the people that we would call an A plus, and an A plus is somebody that's in our database that is likely to refer business to us or has referred business to us in the past. That's an A plus. So when they post something like a picture of the sushi lunch they had the other day, you're going to say something about it, like it, and make a comment. Like instead of us posting, we like, share, and comment on the posts that our database have made, even if we don't really care about it, right? Even if you don't care about their sushi lunch, you like it and ask them a question about their lunch, which when they answer, the algorithm picks up the interaction and they're now more likely to see your stuff. By the way, I didn't put it there, but most people have a birthday. There's a joke there at some point, but most people have a birthday. And if they have a birthday, should we do something on their birthday? Now, you could take that from simply on Facebook, typing in happy birthday, right? That's a low level. You could get a image of a birthday cake or funny birthday picture and post it 
on their birthday, that's raising it a little bit of a, of a notch. You could text them, right, happy birthday, rather than just posting it with all the other 500 friends, you know, on Facebook. If they were somebody that's referred business to you, you could get them like a real birthday card and maybe a real birthday present. Just say. So this is our follow-up program. So um, lead generation, I've got a little bit of difference in some of the forms. They, the, the, the idea is pretty much the same. Um, one of the things that I included, and I'm going to shift to it because I like it better. I just do. Uh, where is it? Here. Um, mm -hmm. So there's this workbook, which is what most of you have been following along. If we go towards the end, I'm going to just talk a little bit about this now. Um, one of the things when we're talking about goal setting, you might want to spend a little bit of time and think about this. Where would you want to be? Eventually, most people, I, I have difficulty going out more than five years because, you know, I'm old, you know, you never know. Um, where would you need to be in three years? Where would you need to be in 12 months? Where would you need to be in six months? Where would you need to be in three months in order to reach that goal? Could you please share where we can find information about database and emails using Google? I have a website, I mean, a YouTube channel called UpThink Real Estate. UpThink Real Estate. And if you go to YouTube and you search for UpThink Real Estate, remember to subscribe and hit the bell so that you'll be notified right away of any new videos I might have and won't be at the mercy of YouTube's algorithm. Isn't that what I'm supposed to say? Right. Um, so go and, and subscribe and you will find this year, 2021, I posted a video, I believe, on how to use Google. Maybe it was 2020 how to use Google free and almost free products for a database. Or call me about joining eXp where we'll give you one that eXp doesn't own. So, and then it goes down, where do you need to be in 30 days next week and what do you do today? So one of the ways of looking at this is let's say in five years, I, how about this? If I wanna reach a goal in five years, to make $500,000, let's say, in gross commission income, which by the way, in our market is not that difficult to do, right? Given the price point. Let's say I wanna make $500,000. What would be the one thing, if I could narrow it down to one thing that I would need to do this year in order to reach that five-year goal? What might be something that I would need to do that I could do in one year that might help me reach a goal of making $500,000 a year in five years. This is an audience participation in case any of you feel like it. They don't feel like it. Um, uh, and um, thank you, Jody. Um, how about having a certain number of people in my database at the end of the year, right? So if I had a thousand people in my database at the end of a year, would that be one thing that I could do so that in five years, I would be making $500,000? Does everybody understand? Of all the things that I could do, what would be the most important thing that I could accomplish in one year that would reach that five-year goal? All right, so let's say, what is the thing I could do this month that would be the most important thing that I could do to reach that goal of getting $500,000. What could I be doing this month? One answer might be, since you guys aren't blurting them out, uh, one answer might be I could get my database together, right? I could get my system set up. What would be the one thing I could do this week that would help me reach that monthly goal of getting my database together to reach the annual goal, to reach the five-year goal, what would that be? It might be, let's say, I'm going to pick the system that I plan to use to follow up with my database. How about that? Then what could I do today? Does everybody see where I'm going with this? What would I do today that would allow me to reach that goal 
the, of what I'm going to do this week, I might today get a list of all the top systems that I could look at that would help me pick the one to start the process to get the, does everybody see where I'm going, right? And then the next question might be, what could I do right now? Right, uh, and I know you're thinking, not listen to you and go do something else in my computer, but what could I do right now that would allow me to do that, right? Um, and I'm hearing database, database, database. So that's really what we're thinking here, because if we can focus on those things, hey, how you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. Good to see you. Only virtually. Only virtually. <laughs> um, and I've gotten better at recognizing people with masks on. So. ETA, now this has been called a 135, it's been called the GPS. Um, there's a bunch of different versions of it. And ETA is expectations, targets, and actions. So what would be an expectation for 2022? And I'm gonna explain what do we mean by, by who and by when. Now, one example might be that, um, let's just start with a target number one, buyers, right? Let's say my expectation is I'm going to close 12 transactions in 2022. Does there, see how we're doing this? So expectation 2022, 12 closed transactions, right? 24 would be good, right? You understand? Know you have to pick your number. Now the question is, if I'm going to close 12 transactions or 20 transactions or 40 transactions, by the way, at a million dollar price point and a two and a half percent size, 40 transactions would produce $1 million in gross commission income. I'm just saying, at a million dollar price point and a two and a half percent size, 40 transactions would equal $1 million dollars in gross commission income right i'm just saying right so let's say your goal is five hundred thousand. you you're going to have to pick your own number there are three targets that i would look at and target number one would be sellers so if you're going to let's use 20 as an example right your goal is to close 20 transactions in 2022 so the question is, how many of those do you plan on being buyers and how many of them do you plan on being sellers? For purposes of simplicity, let's just say it's 50-50. You want 10 listings and you want 10 buyers. So we're gonna start with listings. Target number one would be 10 closed listings. 10 closed listings, that's target number one. Now, I'm gonna get into the by who and by when because some of the things that we're going to do don't have to be done by me, right? Some of the things don't have to be done. So now the question is, what would be five things I could do, five activities that I could do that could produce a listing? For those of you, I know, just don't, don't everybody shout it out at one time, but what would be some things that I could do to get a listing? Number one, could I contact my sphere of influence? Right? I could write that down, sphere of influence. Do I have an idea of how many listings I might get from my sphere of influence? If you do, you would write that down. Our goal is to get 10. How many of them do you think will come from your sphere of influence? Two, three, four? What else could we do? Repeat clients, repeat customers, right? Buyers that we've worked with in the past, people we've worked with in the past. Now, if you don't have any, then we're not gonna write that down. But if you've got people that you've worked with in the past and you can contact them, how many listings do you plan on getting from working with people you've worked with before? That would be number two. What is another way that you could get listings? Could you have a geographic farm, right? Could you have a geographic farm, right? Where you go and you post cards, you use core facts, you knock on doors or whatever. If you have a geographic farm, how many listings do you think you might be able to get from your geographic farm? Now it doesn't have to be five, but you see where I'm going. We're now listing some activities. What would be another activity that could produce listings? Could I talk to for sale by owners, expired listings? Could I look for people that have notices of default? 
bankruptcies, getting divorced? Could I look for referrals from different kinds of vendors? I'm going to talk about vendor referrals. 25% of the people that are having their house painted say they're doing so because they plan on selling it. 25%. How many house painters are in your database? Open houses, Jane says. I could do open houses. That's 3% of the sellers say that they got their agent by meeting them at an open house. I've listed homes because I did an open house and a neighbor walked in. All right, so we could sphere of influence, past clients, geographic farming, right? We could do open houses. We could work with vendors. If I'm going to sell my house, might I talk to a landscaper, a kitchen remodeler, a flooring contractor, somebody that hauls junk away? Right? How many of those people are in your database that you follow up with and work with? So does everybody see where we're going? Now, the, the by who and by when, but by who means, do I have to do all of those things? Do I have to, are there ways in which I could automate a follow-up system? Are there ways in which I could automate geographic farming? The answer is yeah, right? Corfax, check out your credit card. Right? Take out your credit card, right? EXP, which works with KV Core, which is inside real estate, has a thing called Nosy Neighbor, which I just like the name of it, which is automated farming system, right? My farming material used to say, are you a nosy neighbor? So does everybody understand the goal would be to come up with five specific actions that we could take in order to meet our target of getting that many listings, 10 listings. And do what are the choices of by who? Me, not me, or either me or not me. So for example, geographic farming, that doesn't have to be me, right? It doesn't have to be me. I can hire somebody to do that. Following up with my database, the phone calls might have to be me, but the other parts of it don't have to be me. Producing a newsletter doesn't have to be me. Many of you get stuff from me that I don't write. I don't write it. I have an assistant who writes all that stuff. She's better at it than I am, right? You understand? So the this is called leverage, and leverage means getting other people to help you do stuff. And when would we need to do that, right? So what would be a second target? Buyers. So target number one is I plan on closing 10 sellers in 2022. I plan on closing 10 buyers in 22. What would be the action items that we could find buyers? And they could overlap. They could overlap. For example, sphere of influence would overlap, right? Sphere of influence could overlap. Open houses could overlap. Past clients could overlap. Could you do home buying seminar? Could you partner with lenders, right? Could you, does everybody see a first time home buyer program? Where would we find people that are first time home buyers? They're called renters. So the idea is to come up with five action items and they could, it doesn't have to be five, but we don't want to do too many. Five action items that would allow us to read our, reach our target of getting 10 buyers. The third target is what I call the product. And then I'm going to give you a simpler version of this and for those of you that find this is a complicated form. The third target is the product. And the question is, what is our product? Your license, you know, unless you're a broker, says salesperson. Isn't that what it says, right? That's what your license says. Um, what, what do we sell? What do we sell? Houses? It's you. A service package. Yes, Dimitri's heard this one before. <laughs> so we don't sell houses. And I hate to say that, but we don't sell houses. Sellers sell houses. Buyers buy houses. What we sell is a package of services for buyers and sellers to help them buy or sell real estate. All right? That's what we sell. How good is your package? How good is your value proposition? Can you articulate it? 
if somebody said, well, tell me why I ought to work with you when I'm buying a home, what are you going to do? What's different about you and the other agents? Or do you have something to say, right? So what might be action items for our product? Number one, should you study the real estate market? Should you read about what's going on in the real estate market? Are interest rates going up or down? You know, by the way, usually when inflation goes up, interest rates go up. We're in a weird time, right? You know, let's just say it's weird out there. Should you know what's going on with interest rates, know what's going on with the market, know what's going on with lenders? What else might you need to know? Do you know how to use the multiple listing service? Do you know how to use the technology and the software that real estate agents use? Do you know if somebody said, I'd like to buy a home now? How about this? I know, why don't we talk to more people? And the old school reason was we fear rejection. I'm not sure that's always the case. I think that a lot of times agents don't talk to more people, not because they fear rejection so much, but because they fear acceptance. For many agents, maybe some that are listening to the sound of my voice right now, having somebody say, yes, I wanna sell my house, can you come over in an hour and talk to me, would not be something for joy and happiness it would result in panic, right? Because you might know that you are not ready to go talk to somebody about selling their house. You're not ready because you don't know how to price it. You're not ready because you don't know how to do a listing appointment or a listing presentation. You're just not ready. And if we don't feel ready, we may not talk to people as often as if we did. I'm just, competency breeds confidence which makes us more likely to want to talk to people and more effective when we do talk to them how about that so we might want to put together do you have a buyer consultation do you have a listing consultation right do you have that we might put that down as action items studying the market could be an action items do you have a vendor database if i were talking to somebody about selling their house and the owner said, well, yeah, you know, this is a rental. You can see the tenants, you know, really trash the place, all that garbage in the back. I'll bet you know somebody that'll come and haul garbage away, huh? And I said, no, 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 I, I don't know anyone that does that. Oh, all right, well, that's fine, that's fine. But obviously we're gonna need to get the house painted. Do you know any good house painters that we could call? And I said, no, no, house painters, no, I don't, I don't know any house painters. What about the front yard? You know, it's all torn up. You know, it looks like the one on Malcolm in the middle, for those who remember, it looks like that. You, you must have some good landscapers, right? You must know a good landscaper. And I say, no, 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 I don't, I don't know any landscapers. Now, do you understand at this point, I don't sound like much of a real estate agent, do I? I don't sound like a real estate agent. Should a real estate agent know a house painter and a house cleaner and a kitchen remodeler and a flooring contractor and a roofing contractor and a hauling person? I, I used to have these guys and they'd make junk disappear. God knows where they took it, right? I have no idea, but you gave them cash and whatever was there disappeared, right? They would just take it away, right? All of those professions, should you give tax advice to people? Of course not. So how many CPAs do you know? Should you give investment advice to people? Is a flip better than a long-term hold? Not unless you're a certified financial planner. Do you know any of those? Does everybody see where I'm going with this, right? So part of what you would need to do to make your product better is for you to have the connections with the people that clients are going to need. Locksmiths right? You get the idea. Alarm companies. By the way, in my training program, I have a video on this, and I have a really long list of all of the kinds of people you might need to know. How many of you have, like, I did a class on the new residential purchase agreement. I've been watching videos by the California Association of Realtors, which is why it looks so bad today, because I've been listening to lawyers for the last few weeks. And of course, what do the lawyers always tell you? What does your broker tell you. I know, for example, if I go to the EXP brokers and the question is not a broker question, but a legal question, they're going to say the client needs to talk to a lawyer. How many real estate lawyers do you know? If you had a client that said, great, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Give me a name. And you're like, oh, uh -oh. Uh, 
I don't know a name. Now, one of my suggestions is, and I know the Santa Clara County Association of Realtors has a list of affiliates, right? I know that, right? And I know that your office might have a list of affiliates, but my suggestion is not them. That's my suggestion, not them. And the reason I would say not them is they might be good at these things, but they're probably not on your team. Right, one of the big mistakes that I hear new agents making is they'll say, I went to the top agent and I asked who their landscaper was. So yeah, if that landscaper, by the way, got a lead from somebody that was thinking of selling their house, are they going to give it to the new agent or to the experienced agent that has been working with the landscaper for a long period of time? Obviously, the experienced agent is going to get it. You need your own posse right? You need your own posse. And my suggestion would be that when you're talking to them, you would ask them questions like when your clients have real estate questions, do you already have somebody that you refer them to? And if they say, yes, I have a relative who's a real estate agent, get another landscaper, right? Find a good one, good Yelp reviews that isn't in a committed relationship <laughs> with a real estate agent. Does everybody see what we're doing with this? Right now, this is a one page business plan. Now we could, if we have a lot of free time and we're analytical, am I almost over time? Wow, I don't know. The lunch took, I, I've talked too much. Uh, we're gonna wrap this up in a little bit because I, I know where I'm in in the process. You could, for each one of these things, come up with five more action items, geographic farm. I could come up with the five things I need to do in order to implement a geographic farm. Number one, I would call Lynn at Chicago Title and tell her I want a farm, right? Wouldn't that be one thing I could do, right? I would have to pick one, right? I would have to decide who's going to send out the postcards and what they're going to be and what the message is, right? Each one of these things, open houses, I could come up with five things that I would do to get an open house. Right? Now that we've done that, the question is, when are we going to do it? So um, what is our annual expectations? By expectations, we mean goals. So my goal in 2022 is to close 20 transactions. I'd write in 2022, 20 transactions. Now, I might want to make it more specific in that my goal, in addition to closing 20, 20, 20 transactions, is to add 2,000 people to my database. Right, that could be an annual goal, a thousand people to my database. Once I figure out how many people I need in my database to reach my goal, I would write those down in my annual expectations. So what am I gonna do in this, right now it's November, but what would I be doing in either November, if I'm starting this in January, I can start it in December. The 12 months doesn't have to be a calendar year, right, doesn't have to be. So what am I going to do next month? I'm going to add so many people to my database. Now, I may not be able to predict how many transactions I'm going to close, because if they're not open, they're probably not closing next month. I could come up with a guesstimate of appointments. I could, as a monthly activity, say I'm going to get my vendor database together. By the way, if you listen to lawyers talking about agents and recommending vendors, they usually tell you you should give three vendors to every client, at least three. So you understand I need more than one landscaper. I need three landscapers. I need three plumbers. I need three electricians. I need three lawyers and three CPAs and three certified, yeah. And by the way, you can get a lot of business from that group. So let's say a monthly task is going to be, I'm gonna get all my vendors together in one month. Next month, December is my get my vendor list month. Does everybody see where we're going? It might also include, I'm gonna contact so many people, I'm gonna add so many new people to my database next month. If my goal is to do a thousand in 12 months, next month, I'm gonna add 400 people to my database, 500 people, whatever the number is. Does everybody get where I'm going with that? Now the question is, what am I gonna do next week? What am I gonna do next week? I could list as a action item, I'm gonna get my listing presentation together, my buyer consultation together. I'm gonna to learn how to use zip forms, right? I'm gonna get my templates all set up so I don't have to ask Mike how to write the offer every time, 
right? I'm going to, you, does everybody understand we're going to list what our next week, out of the things we want to accomplish next month, now the question is which are the things that I'm going to commit to next week? Now we don't do week one, week two, week three, week four. What we do is we wait to the end of week one. And then if we, if my goal, let's say in week one was to talk to 50 people in my database, what I'm going to do is at the end of the week, I'm going to ask myself, did I really talk to 50 people? Let's say I only talked to 40. Now, what that means is either I need to lower my goal or step up next week the number of people I contact. One of the companies that I worked with, they had software for this sort of stuff, and it wouldn't allow agents to modify their goals on their own. Why not? Why couldn't an agent change their mind? And the answer was, because we had found that if agents were given two choices, one, increase their efforts, or two, lower their goals, most of them would lower their goals to match their efforts. You understand the opposite is really what we want. We want your efforts to match your goals, right? Does everybody understand? So if I don't talk to enough people, if I don't do the listing presentation, I don't get it together week one, then I have to move that over to week two. Because if that's in my monthly one, then it needs to be there. I don't have to do all those things. Right, some of those things I could get somebody else to do. Um, and then this is week three and week four. But I know there's 4.3 weeks in a month, but you know, that's, that's, that's it. Now, when you've done that, what you want to do, like I have a coaching program and anybody who's hearing the sound of my voice, if you're part of my EXP team or somebody that I've sponsored or somebody that's interested, in coaching, I do coach agents at other companies, in Tarot and Keller Williams and others. I do, I don't tell them that, but I do. Um, and if you wanted to have like a weekly meeting where you could tell somebody whether or not you reach the goals and what got in the way and what we could do differently, that could be part of the program. Why do people become real estate agents? To make money? Most don't. But to make money, freedom and independence, flexible schedule, right? Now, it might be more effective if we had our reasons as to why we're in real estate. What are the 20% tasks? Remember, I talked about that 20% of the things we do will produce 80% of the results. What would those be? Conversations with people about buying, selling, or investing, showing property open houses, writing offers, which also would include negotiating transactions, following up with people. Those are examples. The 20% that produces 80% of the money, those are the things we want hardwired into our schedule. All right? We don't want to just be busy. Then speaking of, this is just about the quadrants. This is related to the 20%. What are things that are important and urgent that we need to do? So rather than this being a to-do list, this is a must-do list. And think about that, again, if you have questions. An example of a schedule. When I was in the coaching program, my coach would look at my calendar and say, I don't see where you're planning on doing that. And one of the things that I learned is rather than making a to-do list, what I do is I open up Google Calendar. So let's say I'm going to call 50 people on Monday, right? Let's say I'm going to do that. In my calendar, I would create a block for, this by the way, was a revelation to me. A calendar does not just mean appointment. This was a revelation, right? Calendars don't just mean appointments. The appointment could be with myself. I'm going to call 50 people. And one of the things I like about Google Calendar is if I had their names and phone numbers and information, I can drop that into the description. Here are the 50 people I plan on calling, and I'm going to do it at what time for what period of time. And by the way, if it's in my Google Calendar and I open it up on my phone, all of those phone numbers are hyperlinks, and when I tap them, the phone dials. And I have a headset, 
which I even brought, I even brought with me, right? Because, you know, I don't know. right? So you understand rather than making a list of to do's, take that list and put it in a calendar. When are you going to do it? Right? Time, this is the last of the, the last of the Kool-Aid that you need to swallow. Time blocking. Right, the last cooling, time blocking. And you might want to look like this is just a sample that I stole, borrowed from somebody, um, researched, researched, how about that, from somebody. This is just an example, but you might want to look at your schedule. And I would start with if you have kids and you take them to school and that, put that in the calendar. If there's things you do because of, of, a, of a church or a family or what, put that in your calendar. Right, we we do that first, and I'll bet that you can find at least three hours a day. I'll bet that there's at least three hours a day that you can find for having conversations with people. I'll bet, and then we time block it. Right, that's just an example. All right, well, um, I I had told Lynn had asked me if I was really going to go for three hours, and I said no, it would just feel like that. And I guess it not only feels like that, but I actually did. Any any questions or anything, any final comments? If you would like to know more and you want to know about coaching and you'd like help putting together your plan and you have questions about putting together your plan, reach out to me. You know, it's kind of sort of what I do. All right. Thank you all for coming. Next time, everybody come and get the free box lunch at the San Antonio County. Oh, no, no, no. Thank you. Thank you.